And soldiers seen two, four, eight, yeah. ten, and eleven. The idea was to use one tune <laughs> over and over and over again. <laughs> use that material. I just thought this was. I, oh no! Let me see. Scene ten for soldiers. Well, scene ten, I think, was my attempt to give some variety to this this repetitive joke. This is where they're gossiping uh, about what happened on the on the cliff. Uh, where they were caught in the rain. I'll just let me remind myself of this here. Okay, I use, incidentally, the uh, bugle calls I use throughout the show are, are authentic. I got some Italian army music bugle calls, but I also stole one from the movie because I figured that was authentic too. Um, okay. Here's a series of sixths. A seventh and a fifth. What is that? This does not. This does not look like a long line to me. This does look like a series of chords over um, over an, uh, over a, um, a, 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 a pedal point. Let's see if that's what I did here. But that doesn't look like them. Mm bomb. Mm bomb. I don't seem to have used that. Wait a minute, here's some half notes held to half notes. Here the here it is. On page three <laughs> bars. Oh, isn't it interesting that I didn't put bar sixteen here? You got a pencil? I have a bar sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and twenty. I obviously wanted a set of uh, I wanted to get into the dialogue because there's it goes into the nightmare. And either it is conceivable that this page, no, it's not conceivable that this page was, I probably hadn't quite written this, uh, the, 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 the lyric here. So what I did was, knowing from previous soldier scenes that the sustained whole note chords, which occur in the other side, that I wanted somehow to break them up so that we could fragment them and suddenly get into the nightmare, which follows it segues immediately into nightmare music, so that instead of going da bom bom it da da ba da, and by holding the half notes over, you get dissonances, mm -hmm. so that we know we're going to something dissonant. And it sounds first of all, it echo, it, it, it's it's fairly constant. It, it, there's six. Suddenly, there's a seventh there, and this eighth is very dissonant. Uh, this fifth is very dissonant against that. And so, I had this idea, and clearly, this must have been sitting on the piano, maybe. This sheet was across the room, or maybe this sheet was on my lap, and I thought, oh, I know what this is going to be, and so I wrote those out. So this is merely the sketch. To become more and more sketch. dissonant yes. over the pedal Absol point. Absolutely. Is Absolutely. The yes. idea. Yeah. Okay. So it starts with six, goes to seven, but notice, I mean, it goes right out of the key when it starts getting, yeah. you know, here we are in G major, and there's a, an E flat minor in the middle of it. So that's what that's about. You raised two points. Um, one, authenticity. Yeah. Is it a, when you're doing period pieces, how much Well, do you know, you... what do I know about Italian bugle calls? Nothing. And granted, the audience wouldn't know the difference either, but why should I invent them when they're in public domain? And, uh, and when they're authentic, you know, why make one up? And I listen to a lot of bugle calls, a lot, you know, three dozen, let's say. Uh, the, I found some recording of military bugle calls from the Italian Army. I don't ask me how. I think Paul Gemignani may have found it for me. He's the conductor of the show. And meanwhile, I listened. There are four or five different bugle calls in the movie. And I figured if anybody knew what the bugle call for retreat and the bugle call for revelry would be going for, would be Edward Scola, who directed the movie. And so I assumed that he had done research and gotten some military advisor to say, this is what you want. So I figured, why not use them? Uh, and they became valuable in terms of, because I utilized them. I didn't just use them as decoration, I took little rhythmic ideas from them and little melodic skips from them. I mean, granted, it's all, always one, three, five, and one. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a, as I say, triadic, but uh, it's very useful. Um, I wouldn't think that up, but that becomes useful. It suggests things, not necessarily that I echoed that in a melody, but to use that against a melody. But to know that that's the rhythm, is important or useful. So. Uh, so authenticity, not for the sake of authenticity, but because it gives me something that I can steal from that is uh, part and parcel of what I'm trying to do. It isn't from an... I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a Sousa bugle call. I would take an Italian bugle call. 
But when you said have a show that's set in a certain time, a certain place, oh, sure. do you w worry that a certain chords it, or harmonies it, wouldn't it, have been done then? It or depends. It, it depends. Uh, Pacific Overtures is a perfect example. I went and I studied, studied two weeks uh, in Japan, was there for two weeks, and got some records of the various Japanese instruments that I knew nothing about, and decided that we used sh shakachi and and uh, uh, the little organ piece, uh, the little organ thing that I've name of which I've forgotten, and a show, a show, a shakachi and a show, and uh, samisen. And uh, listen to them and listen to the Japanese scales, which are you know, essentially pentatonic minor scales as opposed to the Chinese, which are major. And then try to devise music that essentially used that. But of course, tonal music, Western tonal music, you can't imitate Japanese music because the intonation is everything in, in, in Japanese music. It has nothing to do with the notes. And but so it feels in the first act of Pacific Overtures when music is for the most part Eastern, it feels like it belongs in that show, in that milieu, uh, in that country, as opposed to another one, as opposed to setting it in New York in 1960. And uh, that's my idea of the uses of authenticity. I think uh, authenticity is useless. Otherwise, if I were writing a novel, that'd be a whole other, other, other thing. One of the things, in fact, that in Pacific Overtures, that John Wyman got for me was a sort of um, day book of uh, 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 various Japanese customs and uh, traditions and superstitions, some of which I used in lyrics, and they are authentic, a spider on the wall being a sign of so that's, yeah, exactly all that. As, uh, 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 that's authentic, uh, or at least authentic in this day book, which was printed, I don't know, early 20th century, maybe later, but the point was by somebody who lived there. And so I have to assume that, and that's useful. And it doesn't matter whether it's true or not, it suggests something exotic in the real sense of the word. So that's, I think, the uses of authenticity, and obviously when I'm dealing with as in Follies, you know, the old tunes from the Ziegfeld era. You listen to, you know, listen to authentic uh, Victor Herbert and Jerome Kern, and, and uh, yeah, then you util utilize what, what they were doing. Um, language, same thing. Although, one of the things we do with Sunday in the Park with George was James very carefully wrote it so it sounds like a translation from the French. It's, um, there are very few contractions in it. People usually say cannot. And it's slightly clumsy and slightly stilted, and it seems to be just right. It prevents it from being colloquial in the wrong way. Did you follow that through with your lyrics? Try to, try to. Yeah, but the uh, again, if your ear is sensitive and mine is to the uh, nuances of language, you can tell when something sounds 20th century and when it doesn't. And I'm not talking about ain't. I'm talking about subtle, subtler than that. And. Um, um, uh, there are aspects of the lyrics that are slightly stilted and deliberately so. In Sweeney and Joanna, where um, that it's not a tritone, but the... The blue notes? Uh, yeah. W was that a tough I, decision? Was yeah, that a... Yeah. I'm not sure I made the right one. Sometimes you make a choice because all the other choices seem less good. And it may not be ideal, and maybe if I'd searched longer I would have found the right note there. I was aware of that blue note, and I thought... But if I had not used everything else, everything else sounded either repetitious or boring or expected. Expected in the wrong way, meaning flat, meaning anticlimactic. That sounded slightly startling, and you're not the first person to point it out, and it may have been a mistake. It may have been a mistake. It's my favorite moment. Well, think, so, but maybe but that's because you're perverse. Seriously. That, you know, can you explain why it's your favorite? I remember the first time I was in the theater seeing it, and the recording hadn't come out. And literally, I got chills up my well, spine at that because, moment, but, and I was. But I, it's partly because you were startled. It was. It was partly because you were startled. If you'd heard a saxophone in the middle of it, it might have done the same thing. But for that point in the show, too, I mean, yeah. it made me nervous. It made me. It, it just played out with everything else that was going on on the stage. One of the things that Blue Note does is it makes the next phrase really telling. Da 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 da. Suddenly, the sun comes up. The sun, the change from major to minor is called for. Uh, minor major, as <laughs> Cole Porter said. Um, and um, so sometimes, it, that, incidentally, that happens in lyric writing quite often. You will deliberately, you know that you've got a really good third line, and you can't 
make the second line so good. But it isn't so bad because the second line's a little weak, so it makes the third line stronger. I remember this, there's a lyric um, of Cole Porter's in uh, Kiss Me, Kate, in Where's the Life That Late I Led, uh, where he says, it's lucky I'm Mr. Gangster's sister from Chicago, which simply doesn't belong in any way, shape, or form in that lyric. And I thought, I wonder if he deliberately did that to make the rest of the lyric brilliant by having one terrible line that all the other lines say, wow, you know? I, I don't know, I don't think he was that devious, but I wouldn't put it past him there. I, that he might have written that and thought, gee, that doesn't belong in this song, but what the hell, it'll make the ones that are really elegant sound more elegant. Do you ever think about when you do something that is startling that way, the fact that over time it's not startling anymore? So no, I never think about that. It, and it's like, I didn't use the note to startle. It's because I was looking for something warm and something that wouldn't anticipate the, I remember it was a B flat and wouldn't anticipate the B natural. I didn't want to use the B natural in front of it. And um, at the same time, if I used an A, it was too flat. And I want, it, I want it to be below the note that was coming. You know, you don't have a lot of choice. You've got a B there. You want to get to, well, you've got a B flat, you've got an A, and then you've got an A flat and a G. Right? What else? Now, you know, Kern, who was notorious for finding, you know, whatever, was it Stendhal who talked about the bow mall, finding exactly the right note. Oscar Hammerstein used to describe listening to Kern go, da, 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 Da 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 da. Try every single note of the scale, and once you hit that, go on to the next phrase. And that's what I did. I tried every note, and I couldn't find one. And Kern might have found, found another way of starting the phrase differently, so it could have a different. Do resume. you often do that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Going oh, through every. Absolutely every possibility. First, I look at what what is the scheme that I'm using, and what belongs, and usually, usually the scheme will, will dictate it. But sometimes it's just dramatically unsatisfying. It's the right note. But it's not fresh. It's that thing of being ine it's inevitable, but it's not fresh. So opening doors when he's the the, the thirty two different harmonizations oh. of that is that's, that's really you got it. How that's what I do. That's that's my that's my big autobiographical number. That number, everything in that number is me, and that's one of them. That's exactly what he's doing. He's trying everything out until he gets it. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I don't know how many other composers work that way. I've, re I've never talked to any other composer of my own generation, anyway, uh, or of any generation. I haven't read enough about uh, uh, composers in the past, but I'm sure that Kern was not the only one to do this. Can't have been. But I remember Oscar describing how it would drive him crazy, because here in the next room, you know, he's trying to write his lyric, and I'm just hearing this thing go over and over again, day after day after day, until, after it, day so after day. <laughs> <laughs> until it sounds fresh, which is what's so great because you hear all the things you are, you can't imagine that you worked on it at all. The other thing about the soldier's number, it, it, one of the evolutions in, in your work that seems apparent is it, the textures seem to be coming thinner and thinner, obviously not all the time, but this is a good example of a number where there's very thin textures and I know you, less is more is one of your sort of... Also, the older phrases, you get, the older the, you get, the, the, uh, the fussier you get about less is more, I think. I think it happens. I think that's why so many classical composers end up writing string quartets. It's called, I don't need the oboes and I don't need the trumpets. Let's just do the music. Let's make the colors. I'm going to do a piece that's only going to be black, white, and blue. No reds and no greens and no oranges. And uh, I found it happening to myself. I now... I'm, I'm, the score I'm writing, Wise Guys, I'm, I've got my usual five and six note chords in there. I'm thinking, do I really need five notes? How about four? How about a triad? Just D, F sharp, and A. No C sharp. No inner voice. Just D, F sharp, and A. I'm not the first person to use it, but it doesn't matter. How about a little less? And it's hard because... Uh, I, I have to speak for myself, but uh, the older I get, the less confident I get in what I do. And yet, I think, don't cover it up with either wrong or extra notes. What's necessary? And don't have so many wrong notes. You know, what's wrong with a straight five chord? It doesn't have to be a five, seven, it doesn't, blah, blah, blah. blah. And I've just made a third revision on a song to make it simpler. Simpler in this sense. That's like, take out the underbrush or the overgrowth, whatever, whatever you want to call it, 
And um, I think that happens in a big way over a period of time. At least it has to me. Yeah. How does it affect how you think of your old scores? Uh, I, I, I like the old scores fine, and, and they say it seems right to me that Sweeney Todd is thick. That seems right to me. Whereas, you know, uh, Sunday the Park with George is very spare, and that seems right, because look what he did. And, um, you know, it echoes the subject. Um, this is a vaudeville show, wise guys, and vaudeville is not full of complications. It just isn't. And you start to put in a seventh chord in a vaudeville number, not that it's supposed to be imitation vaudeville, but the feeling of vaudeville, and it doesn't belong. There aren't seventh chords in vaudeville. There aren't. I like seventh chords. I, lo I live on seventh chords. Ravel gave us that gift, and I'm trying not to do it, but it's hard. So, the answer so is, is it, it, music, it, if you love seventh chord, is, is, is it it's musically satisfying to compose? In a way, not. In a way, not. And that's I have said jokingly, but not entirely, that I wish I were writing something more pretentious because if you're writing something like Passion, you can afford to have all these big dissonances and these big ninth chords and eleventh chords and thirteenth chords because it's all about huge stuff. But if you're trying to write lean, Train song, scene 11. Oh, yeah. So, well, loving uh, you. Oh, oh, loving you. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, this was written late in the show. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of all the, th the numbers I looked at, for, at least for this show, I saw more alternate versions of that, that very simple the melody. The older I get, well, guess what? Uh, what do you think takes the most effort in the world? Simplicity. And I learn all the time. It's just what we're talking about right now. This is really simple. It uh, cost me an arm and a leg to get this simple and to make, because the problem with simplicity is there's this awful word simplistic, and I'm not sure that I even know what it means, but they're simple-minded and they're simple, and there's a big difference. And most pop music is simple-minded, and most show music is simple-minded when it's not pretentious and overcomplicated or long-winded. Really hard to do. That's, again, what makes me admire the best of Kern so much is how simple, quote it is, the best of Rogers, how simple it is. Um, Cole Porter's never simple, and when he tries to get simple, like, you know, true love or something like that, embarrass me, I think it's terrible. He, he needs to be fussy, because that's his, that, his lyrics are fussy. But the simple composers, Harold Arlen, Sleep and Be, I mean, um, it's really, really, really so admirable when a song is simple but still has character. When, it ha when it's not bloodless, when it's not just simple. And that, that was very hard to do. I, um, it took me a long time to accept this song because of that. Because I thought, oh, come on, there's so little going on in this song. And I was really encouraged because Lapine loved it and Scott Rudin, who produced the piece, loved it. And I thought, all right, well, I'll put it on the stage if you like it that much. I thought, oh, they like it because they can hum it. But they, what they liked, was that Fosca was making a simple statement, simply. And I tend, like many composers, not to be simple because A, it's hard, it's much easier to hide behind a lot of chocolate sauce. And B, I kept thinking, I'm trying to please people instead of do the cap, but I realize that's what she's doing. It's right for her. This is not right for anybody earlier in the show. This is right for her at this point because she's been reduced to this. And it is the simplicity of what she says that starts to change George's heart. This is the key moment in the show. I used to think it was, I, 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 I'll never forget you. Um, I, I wish, wish I could forget Sorry, you. I wish I could forget you. And it isn't. It's this moment. It's this moment where Giorgio first starts to hear her, to hear what she's really saying to him. And as such, it's very moving. I thought, well, that calls for simplicity. It doesn't call for an aria, and it doesn't call for ninth chords. Although it's had plenty of them in it, but, I mean, uh, but uh, you know what I mean. It doesn't call for decoration, but it's really hard to write. And I, um, not, not all moments call for this kind of thing, but when they do, there's going to be a moment in the second act of Wise Guys that's going to, I think, that's going to call for this. Don't hold me to it because it may change. But, and um, I look forward to it with, some, with some dread. No, there was going to be this song. No, no, there, it, no, or? no. It was, uh, no, originally it was a song for Giorgio, as I remember it. I don't remember that the, there's a history to this song, 
And I, th I may have written either something else for her or something for Giorgio or a duet. And then James, as I remember it, kind of pushed me to write something simple for her. I'd have to go back over my notes, which are, of course, right here. But uh, <laughs> uh, I might, I might know. I might know. Oh, it's 48. Ah, see this? Here's what was cut. This is Fosca explaining herself with, you know, the re repeat of that ja da dum, ba da dum, ba da da, but against it, the, the little theme of ja da 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 from the garden. Mm -hmm. And here she's explaining herself, you were right, I was wrong, I must learn to wait, you were right all along, now I know, and I shall be there waiting day and night. And it's called, that's not simple, that's called explaining yourself instead of just saying what's in your heart. Now that's lyrically I'm talking, but that's, that echoes itself musically. Um, so, ah, and here's Giorgio, he sang in the train. Do you know what I feel? This was a whole duet between them, a discursive duet, and it never got in a rehearsal. I don't even think this got copied. I mean, as you can see, it's a fair copy, mm -hmm. but I don't think it ever got to the copyist. And so I think that, I think that this, is, this is what it evolved from, and James said something. I don't know if he used the word simpler, or that he said, I would just like something for her to sing to him at this point in the scene, but that's what it, it was. Sounds sort of came like clowns. Came, came, yeah, yeah, exactly, it came out of the yeah. scene. It came directly out of the scene, instead of being discursive. That's really what less is more is about, is less discursive both musically and lyrically. We, we were talking about other composers and you were talking about Arwen and you've done a lot of pastiche work in, in some of your shows. Mm -hmm. do, do you study their scores first or is it just you know them so well? I know I listen to the records if I, uh, uh, to refresh my mind. On Follies I just listened again. I, I had as a kid of course played all their songs and they each have a distinct harmonic style and that's what you imitate is the harmonic style. Arlen's harmonic style is immediately recognizable. So is Gershwin's, so is Kern's, so is Porter's, so is Rogers. You know, if you play me a song that I've never heard from their mature years, I'll tell you who wrote it. Not from their early years, because their early years everybody sounds like everybody else. Right. But you, you give me middle period Arlen, middle period Rogers, I'll tell you which is which. The decision of which person to emulate for when I've always been curious in follies. I just wanted the, the gamut. I just, everybody I liked. <laughs> but. For losing my mind, it's obviously sort of the man, the, the man I love. Why wasn't it Arlen's The Man That Got Away, which seems like it would have made as much, if not more, sense Well, there. first, The Man That Got Away, I wouldn't believe in a, in a Siegfeld Folly. That's too, too sophisticated okay. a song. Good answer. That's, and the in Pacific Overtures, during the, 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 admirals. the admirals scene, um, you sort of wrote your own version of Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Well, and, it's the 19th and, century, and, 19th century and, British. And Sousa and all well, I wanted the audience good. to recognize what I was doing, and it's 19th century, so who's the 19th century British composer? Gilbert and Sullivan. Who's, you know. but, but why in Assassins, instead of doing your version of Sousa, did you, in that case, decide to use real Sousa? Because that's what they were playing when Roosevelt got, uh, when the assassination attempt took place. That's authentic. That, that is, specific that, piece, that's okay. That's exactly what they were playing. Okay. Right. And um, but in, in the admiral's section, what's the Dutch section based on? I, it's, a it's just a clog. I didn't know. I, yeah. I, I, I think of Dutch. Uh, yeah, I did thought association. What do you think of Dutch? You think the boy with his finger in the dike with the clog shoes and the little hat and the mm -hmm. tulips. And you think of clogs and that's what you think of. That's all. So I was doing a clog dance. Um, in your liner notes for the Jerome Kern album oh that you gosh, had done, yeah. mm -hmm. you, you sort of do one sentence things that sort of describe the Rogers and Kern and Porter yeah. and all of that. Is there one that you can think of for yourself of what, how you would describe your yeah. style? Isn't the right word. R remind me of, uh, give me an example of what yeah. I said about one of them. Oh, no, it's see. in here somewhere. Okay. Um, Maybe I can paraphrase. Whether I can find it quickly or not. Um, with uh, now once you start getting close here. Um, here we go. Um, in Rogers' music 
deceptive simplicity is the trademark, mm -hmm. sudden surprising shifts of spare block harmonies mm -hmm. under essentially diatonic, often repeated note melodies with occasional, occasional unexpected chromatic leaps. The impressive feature of Porter songs is their sophistication, the frequent use of Latin American rhythms, the lush chromatic harmony, and the lengthy extensions of standard chorus forms. Mm, I don't know what I would describe it, because so, I'm so eclectic, and, you know, people say they hear my style. I'm not sure that I would recognize something I'd written. I'm not sure, musically. I know there are certain chords I use over and over and over again, but I'm not sure I would recognize something I'd written. I write in a lot of styles because often I'm imitating a milieu or something like that. And yet, people I respect say they can tell something of mine. And I mean, people I don't respect say it. Um, and uh, so I'm not, but I'm not sure I would recognize it. I do recognize when people are imitating me, but usually it's lyric imitation, lyric style. And I recognize when they're making a takeoff on my music by using, you know, lots of wrong notes and thick chords and that sort of thing. And I recognize what they're, what they're parodying. But I'm not sure that I would recognize a piece of mine that I hadn't heard. Well, you certainly, in the same way you talked about Porter there, I don't know of anyone else who's done such extended sort of musicalized scenes in the way you do. Ah, so, but you're talking about form now. I thought you were talking no, that, about musical that's style. That's one of the things. Oh, okay, fair you, enough. You, you oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. I, I think I could tell that. Because as a musical dramatist, I think I could tell my style. But as, as a composer, I'm not sure I could. I'm not sure. What do you look for in other people's work? How do you judge it? How do you surprise? That's it. Surprise. Just, just don't tell me something I already know. And I'm not talking about lyrically. I'm talking about musically too. I mean, you know, let me hear a voice and let me let me be surprised. As well as, of course, somebody because I'm interested in theater music. Somebody who knows how to dramatize things. Somebody. Who, very few people know how to make me make people laugh. But uh, that I always admire when somebody makes me laugh. Um, and um, but freshness is really freshness and an individual voice, you know, somebody you haven't heard before. That's rare. Is there anything that you can suggest for people of how they get to that point? How they study what they look? Oh, at sure, of they, course. They, Keep writing, and, and it's like it's how, do you, how do you how do you how do you tell somebody to become a grown up person? That's why you develop. If you don't develop, you don't become a grown up person. The same thing is true uh, of an artist. You you find your voice. I, I think I've told you this, but I'll be happy to say it for this purpose. One of the most startling and thrilling things I ever, I ever saw in a museum was there was a Mondrian exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. And in his early days, like everybody else, he was imitating others and that sort of thing. You see, and he's drawing representative things. And then he turned the corner, and there was a picture of a, a painting of a cow, and a second painting of the cow, and it started to break apart, and a third painting of the cow, and it started. And by the time the fifth painting, it was almost Broadway boogie woogie. He had found his voice. And the same thing happened in a Matisse exhibition that was there a few years ago. You turned the corner and you saw where and with what painting he found his voice. But prior to that, he imitated other people. And you could see, and you could see all the influences coming in, you know, that he found his voice. You know, it's always very clear in Lenny's music where his, his uh, influences are, you know. The one influence in Lenny's music that nobody ever acknowledges, including Lenny, is Paul Bowles. That's really who he was influenced by. But you can hear the Copeland, you can hear that. But you can hear Lenny. It's Lenny. I don't care whether you hear strains of the other people. He had a voice. And that's what you listen for in music, is a voice, even if you hear where it comes from. I'm eclectic the way Lenny was eclectic. And, uh, uh, but I have a voice. I have a voice. And, um, you know, with other components. Was there a score where you found your cow? Where you're... Um, curiously enough, you can hear it as early as Saturday night because, uh, you know, that's going to finally be done. And it's just, it's just little peeps through the, through the, through the, through the, the marshland. And, uh, but you can hear the voice starting to sound. And then in forum, you can start to hear it develop more. Uh, company's the first full-blown uh, score I wrote that really, that's me and nobody else. I mean, when I say nobody else, it's everybody's influence, but it's me. Have you ever solicited musical help? Did you ever go to Lenny and say, I don't know how to get from here to here? No, or not or in terms it? of composition. I did that when I wrote the background music for a play called Invitation to March because I was orchestrating for the first time in my life and I had never studied instrumentation, and he helped me with that. And he helped me make transitions instrument to instrument. But uh, I don't ever remember going to him with a specific piece of music and saying, what do I do here? I don't remember that.